Good morning. I think we can do a little bit better than that. Good morning. There we go. Welcome to worship here at the Altona Bergteller Mennonite Church. It is good to gather together to worship our God, whether we are here in the sanctuary, watching online, or watching at a later date. This morning, there are a few announcements. So first, I would like to invite Andrew Rempel forward. Good morning. As you may have heard, Amanda Weens has resigned as our education coordinator, and the Personnel Commission has reluctantly uh, accepted her resignation. We thank Amanda for her many, many, many years of serving our children through Sunday School and the Ventures programs. Her gifts will be greatly missed. We would like to wish her all the best in her new endeavor, and we'll continue to work with her uh, until this uh, current Sunday School year is done. Thank you, Amanda, for your leadership to our kids' programs, and God bless you in this next chapter of your journey. Yes, thank you to Amanda for all that you have done for our children. Another announcement this morning is... Uh, to check out the thank you in our bulletin for the mitten tree. There have been mittens and toques and slippers all knitted and contributed by this community, so thank you. Lastly, this morning, we ought to wish all of our folks in the bulletin a happy birthday. If you see them out throughout this week, wish them blessings on their day, even if you might have missed their day. And particularly, I note this morning, a happy 13th birthday to Morley Wall, who I'm sure is watching at home. Let us come together now to sing and worship. I invite us to sing together with the hymn and the worship band, Be the Center.
Thank you, worship team, for leading us into worship with the words, Jesus, be our center, be our source, be our light, Jesus. Welcome to the Berchtaler Mennonite Church of Altona. And it is good to worship with you, even on this very chilly, crisp winter's day, or whenever you listen to this service. In this service, the worship team is leading us in music. Abby and Stephanie Rempel will join us for the candle lighting, as well as the reading of the scriptures. Kristen Falk will share the children's story. Josh Jansen, our youth minister, will, lead, will share the message this morning. And I am Marianne Lepke, your worship leader. Let us continue. Come together. Be present, sing loudly. You assure us, Jesus, that whenever two or three are gathered, you are there. As we worship together, let us discern God's will for us this day. For in worship, we offer praise, and in reflection, we will find God's message for us. I invite Abby and Stephanie to join me in the lighting of the candles. <clears throat> I will read the leader part, and Stephanie will read the people part. We light the Christ candle as we honor Jesus as our Lord and Savior, friend and companion, Messiah and King. Imagine that we are God's wonders, blessed wonders. Thank you. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds to pray. <clears throat> Lord of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we gather here in a mixture of hope, anticipation, fear, excitement, and expectation. We do not know what the year holds for us, there are things we are afraid of, worries about health and family, job security and finances. Yet there is much to look forward to, weddings, anniversaries, baptisms, holidays to enjoy, friends to laugh with. Lord God, the coming year is full of uncertainty and hope. Whatever the year holds for us, though, we trust you, and we place every day of this year in your care, knowing that, as in the past, you are with us, caring for us with constant love. And so, Lord, we place ourselves into your keeping and dedicate our lives to your service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. The worship team will now lead us in more music. Please join us. Please join us as we sing together. Come, now is the time to worship. <laughs>
I believe it's children's story time. So children, while you make your way down, let's sing Holy, Holy, Holy Lord together. Good morning, everybody. I brought the only two children here today. <laughs> they came in my car. Nope, my van. Should I ask you all of the silly things that I usually do? How was your week? Did your mom drive you crazy this week? No? Oh, OK, good. Whew. What a relief. All right, so at Christmas time, actually, Somebody here told me about this book in fall already, but at Christmas time, our kiddos got this book for Christmas. And it's a good one, so we're going to read it, and I'm going to try and hold it. Are we, if I kind of point it that way, are we good, Andrew? I'm going to try and hold it in such a way that we can try to see at home. I don't know, but it's a good one. It's called, What is God Like? What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And while nobody has seen all of God, because God is far too big for any of us to fully see, we can know what God is like. God is like an eagle, or maybe like a snow owl. We saw one this week. God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift with wings so wide you can play under their shadows. God is like a river, constant and life-giving. When you grow near God, you'll sprout up as strong as a tree. God is like the stars forever present and bright, even when they look and feel far away. You can always look up and see them winking at you. God is like a shepherd, brave and good, a protector who loves her sheep so much that she watches over all of them and knows each of their names by heart. God is like a fort strong and secure with walls that are mighty and safe. Inside, there are hidden places to hold you when you're scared or need a quiet place to rest. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God plants, waters, weeds, and fertilizes the earth until every good thing on it seeks the nourishing sun and grows. God is like the flame of a candle, warm and inviting. With God close by, you can look to the light and see through the darkest of nights. God is like the wind, passionate and full of mystery. God is both, both here and, mysteriously, also over there. 
God is everywhere, swirling throughout the world, whistling across mountain ranges, rustling through trees, and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like an artist, creative and unpredictable, always busy making and remaking everything brilliant and new. God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders to give you a bird's eye view of all of creation. God is like three dancers, graceful and precise. They move to the same music in very different ways, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of color, a dazzling reminder of promise and hope for all people after a storm. God is like a best friend, faithful and true, closer to you than even your brothers or sisters. And because we know what God is like, we know that God is kind, God is forgiving, God is slow to get angry, God is quick to be glad, God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair. She's your protector, he is trustworthy. They are friends when you feel alone. God hopes. God perseveres. What is God like? That is a very big question. One that people from places all around the world, throughout all time, have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe, what makes you feel brave, and what makes you feel loved. That is what God is like. So this week, or maybe even while you guys are listening today, Emma, I know you're a doodler. Benjamin, not so much, but maybe at home there's doodlers too. Here's my challenge for you. Doodle something that makes you feel one of those things. Brave, safe, what was the other one? And loved. All right? Perfect. Let's go back. Join us as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy Lord again. I now invite Stephanie and Abby to come and read this morning's scriptures. 
And this will be followed by the message by Josh Jansen. Good morning. We'll start with Matthew 16, 13 to 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? He asked them. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. John 1, 29 to 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11. In your relationship with one another, have a, the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that God, that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? These words by Shakespeare argues that names by themselves are arbitrary, and instead it is the most basic qualities that actually matter. In a way, I think the poet and playwright is both right and wrong. Throughout our sermon series these last few weeks, we have journeyed, journeyed through the patient waiting of Advent, journeyed and rejoiced at the birth of Jesus on Christmas. We have journeyed and explored the historical context that Jesus lived in, journeyed and examined what Jesus taught and did, journeyed and wondered about the Gospels and how they came to be, we have been seeking to go back to the basics, to learn about and understand who Jesus is more. And so today, so today, we have come to the last question in our series. We will journey and ask again, who is Jesus? Or rather, who have we as the church said that Jesus is? Who have we confessed him to be? Now, there are undoubtedly a lot of different names for Jesus. 
on the one hand, with so many names and titles, it can get a little confusing with what we mean by them. On the other hand, sometimes the names, these titles, these confessional categories become so familiar to us that we no longer think much about them and how they actually work in Scripture and what the truth is that drives them. So this morning, we will journey and dig deeper into who Jesus is and who we confess him to be. To begin, I think it is right that we offer proclamation from the confession of faith from a Mennonite perspective, which we as a church have shared in. These words come from Article 2 and are considered a summary. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh. He is the Savior of the world who has delivered us from the dominion of sin and reconciled us to God by his death on the cross. He was declared to be Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. He is the head of the church, the exalted Lord, the Lamb who was slain, coming again to reign with God in glory. All these words are what we as a church, what we as a Mennonite Church Canada, what we as Mennonite Church USA have confessed about Jesus. In this short summary and in the whole article, it seems like there's so much that we can unpack. But if we try to find some of the different titles for who Jesus is, I can come up with seven. Word of God become flesh. Messiah. Savior of the world. Son of God. Head of the church. Lamb. Lord over all. While I would love to do a two-month-long teaching series on each and every one of these names, I don't think I can adequately do that justice today, and I think that might make the sermon go a little bit long. So rather, let's turn to Scripture and see how three different passages reveal to us the names of Jesus in confession. First, we turn to Matthew. In chapter 16, we find a story that is central to the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As Jesus enters the city of Caesarea Philippi, he is still teaching to crowds of people. He then turns to his disciples and asks them who the crowds think he is. The answers vary among several of the holy prophets from centuries past. And then Jesus asks them directly, Who do you say that I am? Speaking for the rest of the crew, Peter pipes up with boldness, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The scene in scripture in Peter's declaration offers us insight in how Jesus' identity and our confession interacts with the world. As Jesus pulled the disciples of public opinion, the names of faithful prophets like Elijah, Jeremiah, and John the Baptist come up. The crowds immediately got an important part of Jesus' ministry right. It's not a diversion in the narrative of God's interactions with God's people. In many ways, it's not a detour on God's plan. Instead, Jesus belongs in a line of faithful servants of God, prophets willing to stake their lives for the sake of God's people. And Jesus asks them the question, who do you say that I am? in a very particular context. In the story preceding this one, Jesus and disciples travel across the sea and engage in teaching there. Yet Jesus waits until they get to this town 
to ask the question. The town of Caesarea Philippi was a mixed pagan city of Greeks, Romans, and Jews sitting at an intersection on a major road north of the Sea of Galilee. Philip, the son of Herod the Great, renamed the city as Caesarea to honor Caesar Augustus. This Roman ruler also happened to claim the titles of Prince of Peace, Savior of the World, Son of God. Here in the city was a temple dedicated to Caesar. And from the temple opened a famous spring that fed the Jordan River and was believed to be controlled by the Greek god Pan, god of shepherds and flocks. It is here that Peter confesses Jesus' identity. Here it is God's purposes, not Jupiter's or Rome's, in the recognition of God's anointed one, the one who, who has been predicted by the prophets to bring about God's presence and God's agency made manifest in the world. Moving over to the Gospel of John, we step into a story that is narrated by John himself. In chapter 1, verses 19 through 34, John narrates his own activity as he serves as a witness who testifies. On the first day, John faced off with priests sent from Jerusalem. Here his testimony has both religious and legal ramifications. As he basically gives a deposition onto who he is, what he's doing, and why he is baptizing folks. The priest's interrogation of John revolves around a single question. Who are you? John doesn't claim to be Elijah nor the expected Messiah who is sent by God to make things right in the world. But through the words of the prophet Isaiah, claims the identity of witness and the voice crying out in the wilderness. But in his testimony, John actively shifts the attention away from himself and towards the one who is to come. And on the next day, that happens. Jesus appears in the gospel for the first time, yet he doesn't say a word. The focus is still on John's testimony about him. John sees Jesus and declares to those around him and to us, look, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a declaration that when we hear it, ought to totally and completely awestruck us. John is actively linking the past, the present, and the future together. The image of the Lamb of God evokes the Passover lamb so critical to Israel's worship life. This lamb embodied in John's own place and time hearkens us to the future visions of the lamb who was slain that conquers the world in ways which we do not expect. This is the lamb who doesn't just take away our individual sins, but removes and eliminates our collective alienation from God. This is the lamb who reconciles us with the God who loves us. Here in in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist lives as a witness to who Jesus is in the world. Finally, we turn to Philippians chapter 2. Here we find a powerful text, one that Paul uses to encapsulate the Gospel message. In verses 5 through 11, the scripture text celebrates Jesus' incarnation and names it as an act of humility and obedience. 
But even as Jesus, who was and is equal with God, and experiences death on a cross, a, rever a reversal happened. As death is conquered, Jesus is exalted and rightfully crowned as Lord of all. The reversal for Jesus ought to strengthen and embolden believers in times of trial so that they may know that Jesus is truly Lord, that Jesus is controlled, that Jesus has authority in all this. In each of these scripture passages, from Matthew, from John, from Philippians, Jesus is named, Jesus is given titles, Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Lamb who comes to take away the sins of the world, Lord over all. And in each of these texts, we find something meaningful and important about the nature of confession. Confessing and naming who Jesus is is an important part of the life of the church. Shared confession itself is important for shaping us as God's people. We can see this as Israel is shaped through the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. These words ground the identity of God's people, Israel, and they ground it in God's own identity. Confession isn't just about reading a few paragraphs with monotone syllables. Confession serves a purpose in doctrine, declaring what is true. Confession serves as liturgy in worship, as public declaration of faith. Above all, confession and proclamation help us to understand our, to help us to understand our faith even just a little bit more and leads us to witness to who Jesus is. Ultimately, what we say and what we proclaim matters. Words have the power to remind us, to change us, and to move us. The renowned 20th century rabbi, Abraham Heschel, has said that our speech has power. Words do not fade. He said what starts out as a sound ends in a deed. Confession helps us declare what we believe. And even just articulating these ideas, this identity of who Jesus is, begins to shape us. One thing that we do need to be careful about, though, is not simply making Jesus who we need him to be for our particular moment. One example of this is that too often, folks will like to claim Jesus as their personal savior who forgives them of their personal sins. But then that's all they ever need Jesus to be. Jesus is never Lord over all for them. That idea never enters the picture. And if Jesus isn't Lord over all, isn't he Lord at all? What would happen when Jesus became not just Savior, but Lord of our thoughts, Lord of our emotions, Lord of our speech, our relationships, our possessions? I also think that we might be able to reverse those two titles and ask them the same questions. What happens when Jesus is Lord, but we don't think that we need a savior? Questions of identity are central to the gospel and to the story of Jesus. In Caesarea Philippi, Jesus' question to the disciples was nothing short of another way of saying, why are you following me? Why have you left everything that you know? Who do you say that I am? And so it is worthwhile and right for us to ask similar questions. Beloved, why are you here? Why 
Are you on this path? Why have you chosen to follow this Galilean peasant from 2,000 years ago? Who is Jesus to you? Who do we say that Jesus is? Each of these questions is even more relevant if we embrace the fullness of what it means to speak or say in this context. It just may be that we live, that the lives we lead in light of the hope of the anointed one of God, the Messiah, the one who is to come, the lives that we live in light of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the lives that we lead, that the lives that we lead in light of the hope of Jesus Lord over all. These lives are just as critical as that we confess with words, no matter how true, no matter how elegant. That is, when we answer these life-changing questions, the shape of our lives may be just as important as the words our lips give voice to. In some ways, the question has already been answered for us. Jesus get, the scriptures give us many clear pe pictures of who Jesus is. And these we gladly confess. But even as we proclaim, even as we confess, will we let our lives be transformed by our witness? Will, will we let ourselves be transformed by the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world? Will we let our lives be transformed by Jesus, the Word of God incarnate? Will we let our lives be transformed by Jesus, Savior of the world and Lord over all? Will we let our lives be transformed by the one who was and is and is to come? What would happen when we believe and live about who Jesus is? How will our witness change the world? How will we say, that is Jesus? Amen. Please join us as we respond with holy is his name.
Please join me in prayer for the offering, the church, and the world. O triune God, grant us your gracious, guiding presence as we begin another new year. As we join Christians of every time who have awaited Jesus' return, lead us into this new time confident with your promises that your promises will be fulfilled. Spirit of truth, call us to represent to represent, <clears throat> call us to repentance this new year. Forgive us for past unfaithfulness, silence in the face of injustice and inaction amid suffering. Move us from the desire to hoard our wealth toward faithful stewardship. Help us to share our gifts with those who cry out for daily bread. Prince of Peace, Healer and Reconciler, heal the divisions in our church and among the peoples of the world. As you prayed that we should all be one, give us new visions to enable that unity. Be with this, be with us on our ecumenical journey and with those brothers and sisters who surround us in the great cloud of witnesses. God of all ages, release us from fear. Lead us forward, even as you have led your church forward from an empty cross and tomb through 20 centuries. Be our companion as we walk unexplored paths into the un unknown future. Open us to new possibilities. Renew our hope. Grant us faith to move ahead. Be our companion until Jesus comes again. In his name we pray. Amen. Please rise for the words of benediction and the closing hymn. May blessings abound around you this day. Feeling God's loving presence among us, let us go forth into the world, allowing our light to shine on all we meet. Amen.